There are many veterans here. I salute you as I can as a civilian. Um, those of us who are not veterans recognize that someone has to fight our battles. Uh, we're glad that you did it and we're glad that we didn't do it. Uh, I don't think any veteran I've talked to in the last 10 years or more has had anything besides a anti-war um, sentiment that they shared with me. Sometimes we have to fight, but we try very hard not to. We depend on our, uh, our government and our diplomats to keep us out of uh, harm's way. Sometimes those um, efforts fail. But my mission as a writer is twofold, is to honor the veterans who have served and to share their stories with others. Every man and woman I've talked to, of among the nearly 300, uh, has their own intriguing story about themselves, about the service to their country, and many of these stories involve episodes of bravery and perseverance in trying conditions. But very few veterans, even other minorities, have the overwhelming and frankly surprising history of a dedicated and sustained fight to prove their competence, loyalty, and citizenship. Like many other minorities, Japanese Americans and other Asian immigrants and their families faced blatant and sometimes, at that time, legal discrimination in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Chinese people had been here for generations since the California Gold Rush and the building of the railroads. But the Japanese were recent immigrants, most of them arriving in the first two decades of the 20th century. Most were farmers and fishermen, occupations that their island nation depended upon. Many were well educated, as farming was a noble profession in Japan. But in the US, they were undesirables. They were not allowed to become citizens. They paid higher rates on loans and on insurance policies. They could not join labor unions and could only live in certain neighborhoods. They were not allowed to own real estate. So whatever their success here, they could never own their own homes or farms or businesses, and the immigrant nation could not become citizens. Now their children, the Nisei generation, uh, or what I call the Japanese members of the greatest generation, if you want to think about it, were American citizens because they were born here. They spoke English, not Japanese. They ate hot dogs. They joined the Boy Scouts, played football, baseball. They took their dates to the beach. They went to Cal, the University of Washington, and other fine schools. And when the draft was instituted in 1940, they served like other young American men. They were American in every way, but they could not escape the prejudice heaped on them by their neighbors and their fellow citizens. Discrimination was worst here in California and on the West Coast where most Japanese Americans lived and where their skills in farming and fishing were seen as an economic threat by Caucasians. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, the reaction of the Nisei was like that of other Americans. First they were stunned, then they were incensed. In San Francisco, they lined up at the federal building with hundreds of other young men, but they were not accepted for service. We don't take Japs, some of them were told. Lawson Sakai said when he heard that, he felt he had lost all his rights as a citizen. Lawson later earned a Bronze Star and four Purple Hearts in Europe. Their fellow Americans treated the Nisei as if they were the enemy. They lost their jobs. Students, high school students were discouraged from higher education. Those already in the military were discharged or marginalized into medial assignments like picking up cigarette butts or moving boxes back and forth in a warehouse. Community leaders, teachers, businessmen, Buddhist priests were picked up by the police and FBI and taken away without charges being filed. Sometimes five or six months would pass before their families would hear from them again. These, of course, were the family breadwinners. 
The Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco ordered banks to freeze the accounts of Japanese Americans. Things got tough. Uh, remember the depression was still going on. On the West Coast, a dark to dawn curfew was ordered. People were not allowed to travel more than a few miles from their homes. And they were ordered to turn in their guns, radios, flashlights, and sometimes even kitchen knives. There was no protest, by the way, by the NRA. In fact, groups such as the American Legion, the Grange, the California Growers, and the Hearst newspapers called for all people of Japanese ancestry to be permanently removed from California and sent back to Japan. Then, as many as you know, in February of 1942, FDR issued an executive order authorizing any area to be declared a significant military zone and for people to be excluded from that zone. The authority to designate those zones was given to Lieutenant General John DeWitt, who was stationed here at the Presidio. General DeWitt decided that zone should include the entire states of California, Oregon, Washington, and parts of Arizona. And the only people to be excluded were the Japanese Americans. This meant the relocation and internment of nearly 120,000 people two-thirds of whom were American citizens. Ten sprawling camps, concentration camps, as President Truman called them, were constructed in remote parts of the country, such as the uh, Manzanar camp in the California desert. They were built rapidly with millions of board feet of lumber, miles of barbed wire, and labor that was all diverted from the war effort. Their hasty construction meant the buildings were cold in the winter, stifling in the summer, and subject to assault and penetration by the wind-borne sand in desert locations. Ten miles from Cody, Wyoming, the Hart Mountain Prison became the third largest city in the state. People, of course, had to abandon their homes, farms, businesses, and personal property. Leases could not be paid on fishing boats, cars, farm equipment, so it was all lost, and students had to withdraw from schools and colleges. This remains America's largest government attack on its citizens, and the only time the United States has issued an apology for anything, all this, although that took 50 years. The government said at that time the unconstitutional act of the internment was the result of discrimination wartime hysteria, and poor leadership. So I think I've painted a pretty dark picture so far. Um, but it was from this situation, from these camps, that the Nisei men in large numbers volunteered to fight for America. In March 1943, they got their chance. A regiment was formed, a single segregated army unit commanded by Caucasian officers. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team, including the 100th Infantry Battalion, became the most decorated unit in American military history, with seven presidential unit citations, half of them in a period of five weeks. 21 Medals of Honor, 52 Distinguished Service Crosses, 560 silver stars, 9,486 purple hearts. Their casualty ratio, casualty rate was 314%. All this because they fought with an aggressiveness of no other infantry unit, because they fought with a purpose to prove their loyalty to their country. A second significant unit of Japanese Americans that I've only mentioned when I talked about Roy Matsumoto was the Military Intelligence Service. These men and women were trained in the language of the Japanese military, and they served here in the States and with every American, Canadian, and Australian unit in the Pacific Theater. They also uh, served, very importantly, in post-war Japan. By monitoring the enemy's radio transmissions, they directed a squadron of P-38s to intercept and shoot down a plane 
carrying General uh, Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, who was the architect of the Pearl Harbor attack. The MIS interrogated prisoners, negotiated surrenders of prisoners, intercepted communications, and translated documents found on the battlefield. They served in the investigation and prosecution of war criminals. They were called MacArthur's secret weapon. MacArthur said no commander had ever known more about the enemy before a battle than he did with the help of the MIS. Three Nisei linguists were on the deck of the USS Missouri during the Japanese surrender ceremony. Many stayed in the service and served in military intelligence roles in the Korean War and Vietnam. And their success convinced the military of the importance of foreign language training. And we now have substantial foreign language programs, such as those at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey. Imagine this, imagine you were um, falsely accused of a crime and uh, your family was so accused and you were all locked up. Um, you were not only locked up, but there was um, not going to be a trial. You had uh, no defense. Uh, you were put in prison and not told when you'd be let out when you might be let out. What, what are your um, choices? You can fight, you can protest, or you can you know, try to get an attorney and plead your a case. And some of the Japanese Americans did all of those things. These guys decided the best thing for them and the best thing that might help their families was for them to volunteer and to, uh, in order to prove their loyalty. They felt, in a very basic level, uh, if, if we die for our country, what else could, can we do that would be more significant than that? Than that? 